This message entitled, My Lord and My God, was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on May 7th, 2023 by the Rev. Roy D. Warren Jr. The scripture reference is John 20, 24-31. Dear Lord, as we gather now our hearts before you, we do desire for you to plant this word into our hearts. Help us to see, dear God, that you are calling us in, into a place that uh, truly, dear God, is going to hold on to Jesus. Hallelujah. Uh, I do believe, dear God, that's the uh, that's the picture that we have here, dear God. He, he was kind of thinking along his own ideas and his own his own plans and and so forth. Unless I can do this, unless I can touch this and that and something else, and and uh, I will not believe. And and basically, Jesus pretty well said, "Really, really, is that what it comes down to, Thomas?" That. If you don't get your way, you're not going to believe. And I thank you, Lord, that that's not true. I thank you, Lord, it's not true. And that's your mercy, dear God, that you would draw him away from any such thoughts and come into a place where Jesus is everything. Hallelujah. I think that's what it came down to for him. Hallelujah. My Lord and my God. That's everything. That's everything. Glory to God. We thank you. Lord, touch our hearts as we consider these things and as we see it for ourselves, dear God. I think that's what happened with, uh, with Thomas. He saw for himself. And everybody else was offered the same thing. They could all see him. They all saw him, in fact. We don't have any recording of, of anybody touching him, but... It was offered for anybody who just really felt they had to do that. And thank God, they just believed. They just believed. They met the risen Lord. Amen? They met the risen Lord. And for Thomas, praise God, he was his Lord and his God. Glory. I thank you for that, Lord. We pray this all, dear God, in Jesus' precious, precious, and holy name. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, so we're in John chapter 20. And uh, when we get to the actual scripture, we will start with verse 24. I might mention a couple of the things that leads up to it so you, to, so you see why Thomas' story... Um, starts with a contrastive conjunction, a but. So, we'll, but we'll get there. Someone once said that resourceful people have a habit of turning problems into opportunities. Sometimes I don't feel very resourceful. When it comes to all this high-tech stuff and so forth, I'm not, you know, I know I should. If I live another 20 years, I'm going to wish I had learned how to do stuff. You know, along the way, but uh, not likely. <laughs> I don't care too much. But anyway, it is nice when things go smoothly. And uh, so anyway, someone once said that resourceful people have a habit of turning problems into opportunities. And such was the case when a certain father, who prided himself on solving the most perplexing problem of the week. And that particular week, it was this. How to get his teenage daughter off the landline, off the landline phone, so that he could receive important business calls at home. Now, let me just, you got to remember now, this is pre-cell phone days. So it was basically the phone in the house. And what you did then is you either got another whole phone or you got lines. Okay, another line had to be installed. And then, you know, and maybe she'd even have her own phone. Well, of course she'd have her own phone, because how are you going to share that? And the father's still going to miss his important phone calls. Anyway, anyway, so he's, this is the problem of the week. He decided that the obvious solution was to have her have her own phone. Okay, so coming home from work after the installation of the new phone line, he was shocked at seeing his daughter lying on the couch 
with the TV on and the telephone plugged into her ear. When she finally hung up, he asked her why she wasn't using her own phone. She said, I didn't want to tie up the line, Dad. She said, I'm expecting some important calls tonight. <laughs> so was he, was the idea, or, getting, or making phone, uh, important phone calls, whatever. Okay, so was he. Well, a lot of people would maybe respond to all of that and go, oh, my Lord and my God. But that's not the attitude that Thomas had. He's not just there solving the problem of the week. He's not just there trying to get his daughter to understand something. Okay? Not, not, it's not that at all. Jesus, I think, had a similar circumstance. Oh, it's not the same thing, of course. But shortly after his resurrection, he had a similar kind of thing going on, that, but it was on a much larger scale. In fact, it was on an eternal scale that would affect the entire church for all of the centuries to come. The Bible makes clear that all involved would need everybody from back then to now, all right, would need to actually see the resurrected Lord in, in order to truly understand his resurrection power. The Bible says that more than once. They don't get it because they needed to see him alive. Not just hear about it, not just see the stone rolled away. They need, not even angels, not even angels. Okay? It had to be meeting the Lord. Okay? For example, immediately following Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on the back of a young donkey, we are told, this is from John chapter 12, verse 16, these things understood not his disciples at the first. They didn't get it. But when Jesus was glorified, when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Okay. There's no doubt that that first day, okay, uh, out of the tomb, Easter Sunday morning, all day and into the evening would be a very busy one for Jesus. I know there's no doubt about that. Now, too busy? No. I guess that's the point. Jesus is never too busy. Okay? I mean, from a human perspective, we look at it and go, and, and we go, well, oh, he had to go here, and he had to go there, and then he had to walk to Emmaus, and he, and he had to go see, uh, go see uh, uh, Peter, and, you know, and it's just all this. I mean, did he, have a, did he have his calendar with him? Did he have, you know, go see this, go do that, go there? No, it's not too busy for Jesus. It's busy, okay, but it's not too busy for Jesus. And if you happen to, miss us talking about that, and it was probably, was that last week or a couple of weeks ago, um, then it's, it's, I'm sure it's a video message that's on the, on the uh, uh, internet. It was called Busy, Busy, Busy. So if you, want, if, you have, if you weren't here for that, go ahead and take a look at, at, at that. And by the way, I do think that's crucial. I don't think you just let this stuff go. I mean, not only does Joel go to a lot of trouble to get these things recorded and get them out there and put them out, you know, but then to just let it go and forget it and don't do anything with it, you know. And in fact, some people have even said, boy, I, I like just going there and watching it and so forth, even though I was there, you know, because it reiterates what you have heard, maybe even solidifies some things that you um, uh, heard in the process or saw in the process and so forth. So anyway, that's called Busy, Busy, Busy and you can go there and find that. From Mary Magdalene to the other women to Simon Peter to the two followers who met him on the road to Emmaus and finally, I suppose you could call it the Peace de la Resistance. The huge gathering of disciples. I say huge because it was all of them. Eleven of them. Okay, and others. So I'm guessing the women were there 
All these people that have been seeing Jesus all along, they're all gathered. It's a good-sized group, okay, good-sized group. And there were others there, not just the disciples. It says so in the, right in the Bible. All would need to have seen Jesus in order to truly understand what in the world was going on. Now, there's no way, like I said, that we're going to go back and try to recount all of that. I'm just simply mentioning he was a busy day. It was a long day. And he, he goes and meets him. We talked about this last week, that he, he meets them, you know, in the upper room, and he... Uh, deals with everything that's going on in them. Except for one thing. There was one, if I could put it nautically, not naughtily, nautically, okay? He missed his boat. And that was Thomas. He missed the boat, so to speak. His name was Thomas, and you've heard him called Doubting Thomas, okay? And to be perfectly frank, it really was his fault. He didn't show up, or he was there, remember that? I know I'm, I'm not going to take the time to go back over it. We already talked about it. It says there were 11, but when Jesus gets there, there are 10. So one of them took off, and that's Thomas. Okay? John's gospel specifically states that all of them were gathered. All 11, not 12. Remember, Judas is gone. So all the disciples is 11. But then on Easter Sunday evening, as that unfolds, we are told that there are 10 present now. So somebody had to split, so to speak. Somebody left the gathering before Jesus showed up. Thomas left the scene. It even says so. John chapter 20, verse 24, spells it right out. But Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. He was there before Jesus came. Bible says so, okay? But he's not there when Jesus came. All right. We are then, uh, now, I'm trying to be real clear about this. I'm not trying to backtrack and talk about everything, but it's all connected you know, as to why Thomas needed to see Jesus. We are then told that the others met Thomas during the week, ran into him on the road, I don't know, it doesn't say, and told him that they had seen the Lord. And that's when he said, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, it was the next weekend. They were all gathered again up in this room. And remember, it says elsewhere that the doors were all locked, windows are closed and probably bolted and so forth. Why? Because they're scared. They know, if, they know if the authorities can do this to Jesus, that they could do it to them. They could gather them up. They could execute them. They, they could. So they're scared. So they're behind closed and locked doors. Okay? And, and Thomas is there this time. Praise God. And bam, Jesus appears once again. He doesn't come knocking at the door he doesn't go fidget with the bars on the window and try to get that open and then squeeze through. No, he just poof. He did it in Emmaus. And he's right there in the middle of it. Okay? That's his glorified body. See? He can do that kind of thing. He can go, just appear. Just appear. He disappears from Emmaus. He appears in Jerusalem. Praise God. And as he did for all of the other disciples on Easter Sunday, now he does for an obstinate Thomas. You see, this one had really blown it. He had to go the whole week. Look at what this guy missed. Everybody else met with Jesus that weekend before. And there's a peace passes all understanding. There's a, there's a, uh, the, they saw the love of God. They saw his mercy. They saw his mercy that he would stick around and not run up to heaven and, 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 and go ahead and show himself, show his wounds 
and so forth to the people so they would know he's alive, all right? Well, Thomas didn't get any of that. Thomas wasn't there, all right? So he went a whole week without the peace that Jesus had offered to everybody else. See, this was a big mistake. You got to, you know, it's a big mistake. Praise God. Now he would get a second chance. <laughs> Praise God. And then, who was it? And, uh, Billy Graham's daughter, Ann, uh, who, uh, you know, talked about the second chance. He's the God of the second chance. She's got a whole poem on it. Anyway, and that's when Jesus said to him, Thomas, reach hither thy finger. See, it becomes quite obvious that it's mostly, that he's mostly there for Thomas. He's mostly there for Thomas because he wasn't there before. Already talked to everybody before. Now, this is Thomas' turn. Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. Now, in the original Greek, this be not faithless is more of a movement. It's more of a don't become faithless. So in other words, he was in danger of it. He was at least, perhaps he was at least starting into this being faithless. And he wants them to turn around from that. Don't go to that place, Thomas, but rather be believing. So see in the original Greek, it's, there's a movement that's going on, okay? You can't just say he was faithless. You're becoming faithless. Thomas, don't do that. Believe. Okay? Come on, Thomas. Please bear up under all of this. That is what it means in the Greek. Okay? I'm not making it up. That's what it means in the Greek. Bear up under this thing, Thomas, and, and do it with the idea of motion. Thomas, it's the only way you're really going to come through this because Satan is trying to get you through motion to become unbelieving or faithless. It's mo you're moving towards it. Watch out. Okay? You, you, Thomas, please bear up under all of this. Bear up under it. Don't, don't fall to the ground and bow down to what Satan wants you to do. And do it with the idea of motion. This is what it says from the Greek. Okay? So, look up and contemplate the obvious truth, Thomas. And here's the obvious truth. <laughs> In case it's not totally obvious to you yet, Thomas. It's me. It really is. It really is me. I am risen indeed. Jesus is saying all of this. this. I mean, this is what it means in the original language. So I'm not adding anything. This is, this is what it means. Okay, what was Thomas's response? You just, you can't, you can't get enough of this. You just can't get enough of this. This is a guy who a week before says, I will not believe unless I have my way. <laughs> and so he says, my Lord and my God. And literally in the Greek, and I've told you this before, it means the Lord of me and the God of me. Lord of me and the God of me. And praise God, that is when Jesus laid it all out for him as he did for all of the others. He, he, said, he said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And I think what he's referring to is you. I think what he's referring to is me. Because we don't have Jesus right here. I know some people would like, oh yeah, I see Jesus in everything. I didn't say that, okay? I'm saying Jesus is in heaven and Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for his church. Jesus and the Father on Pentecost sent down the Holy Spirit to be an indwelling power of God in everybody's heart and life, okay? So blessed are they that have not seen Meaning 
future generations, meaning centuries later, meaning now, meaning us, okay? And yet have believed. Like, you know, like you and me, like all of us, like everybody since then, okay? Like I said, we don't have Jesus on this earth, but thanks to Pentecost, we do have an indwelling Holy Spirit who's going to guide us and empower us to do the will of the Father. And we need to thank God for that. Amen? Thank God for that. Now, the last two verses of... Uh, by the way, that last uh, response of Jesus was verse 29. Well, look at the last couple of verses. Let's see. Uh, 30 and 31. Yeah. Yes, there it is. 30 and 31. Okay, of 20, of John 20, okay? Really lays it out. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now you can look at that like in the moment, okay? He, he did, you know, remember what we said the week before? How he, you know, you got any, you got any meat? You got any bread? Remember? And then he went ahead and ate them. And showed him that he's not a ghost, he's not a spirit, he's, he's Jesus. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And, and I guess what I want to really make clear is we need to thank God for this one. I'm talking about for this one. All the others, yes, of course, thank God, Amen. But this one is crucial. They all are. But this one, we've got to get a handle on it, okay? Because certainly, every once in a while, we can find ourselves falling into the same trap as Thomas. The thought that we will be all right if we just go our own way and do our own thing, even spiritually. And how many times do we think like that? How many times do we, we don't want to, we don't mean to, but we, we just didn't stay focused for a moment or two. And others have tried this, I'm telling you, to go their own way, think their own stuff on things. I don't care what the Bible says, I don't care what the pastor says, I don't care. And it went rather abysmally for a lot of people. Through the years. Mary Magdalene, for example, thought that she could have her Jesus her way. I mean, now that she found him actually alive, because she's been looking for a dead Jesus. You know, where have you laid him? I'll go get him. You know, she's looking for a dead Jesus. She's not thinking of him as alive. And, and Jesus said, don't shape me. Don't try to mold me. Don't try to make me. Into, and it's not saying that she was doing that. It's saying you're getting close. Mary, watch out. Be careful. Same thing with Thomas. Thomas, you're becoming unbelieving. You're becoming faithless. It's not saying he totally was. It's just, watch out. You're taking a wrong step here. You're going in a wrong direction. And that's the mercy of God that he would tell you that. Amen? Don't forget the two travelers on the way to Emmaus, you know? <laughs> they thought and they thought. I mean, how many times did, did they say, we thought this and we thought that and we think he should have done this and we think he should have done something else? They were not believing. And now Thomas, who was also called Didymus, meaning the twin, you can think about that for a minute and you can think, well, is it possible? Maybe he was the twin of another disciple. I mean, it doesn't mention that. It doesn't say he was, but he was called Didymus, which means the twin. And I suppose this could refer to a literal twin, uh, perhaps one of the other disciples. But from the Greek, from the Greek, it can also speak of being double-minded. Double-minded. He's called the twin. And therefore, as the Bible elsewhere states in James chapter 1, verse 8, unstable in all of his ways. 
The double-minded man, remember? The double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. So, okay, so maybe he's got an actual twin, and maybe it's one of the disciples, I don't know, but there's a spiritual picture here. Watch out. Double-minded, unstable in all of his ways. The church, therefore, and the Christian journey is often pictured to resemble a marathon. And I'm not saying that there aren't connections there, okay? As opposed to a shorter race. Because quite frankly, what they're talking about is that it's intended to go to the end. It's intended to go all the way, cover all the 26 miles, you know? That's what they're talking about. But I, I, I'm just wondering if we don't have another picture of this other type of race. This one with this baton. Picture, if you will, a relay race. You see, it's here that the whole team wins, not just one person. And I understand that, you know, it, it, they work and they work and they work at it to make it across the finish line. They might be two hours late. They might be three hours late. They might be the next day, you know. Did you know they always have officials there? They have to stick with the people and they follow them along. You don't, they don't just run around through New York City and you know, make their way to the thing. There's people who are watching over these people and making sure that they get there safe and sound. Recently, a pastor at Times Square Church, he sent out a message entitled Passing the Baton about legacies. And he put it this way. All relay races are won and lost at the baton pass. A runner runs his leg of the race with all of his strength, but he is not successful unless he places the baton into the hands of the next runner, okay? Because it's gonna slow you down. You go to hand it to the next person and he fumbles it and you let go of it and it falls to the ground, then he's gotta oh, back up, go get it. And you, lose, you lose time that way, you lose steps that way, okay? There needs to be the, the strength to be able to grab it at the right time and to hold on. Into the hands of the next runner for, for their segment of the race, okay? So everybody's got a portion and you put it all together and that's the church. You put it all together and that's the church. There are people that have gone before. David Wilkerson, of course, did all kinds of things for the Lord. Then all of a sudden, he's not here anymore. All of a sudden, he's gone. One must let go, and one must grab on. That's what the pastor says. It is when both hands are on the baton, both, both people, okay, are on the baton that the race is the most critical because the church has longevity. It must be a relay race. There must be runners, not runner, runners, plural because the race is not an individual event there must be a baton to pass no one can run alone very far he says i am reminded of an old zimbabwean proverb this is africa okay a proverb if you want to go fast go alone but if you want to go far run together the church, he says, is about distance, not speed. And I think we are living in a time, and we are living in a culture where it seems that speed has become the determining factor. That's what everybody's looking at, you know. Got the stopwatch out, you know, and make sure he's ahead of the, head of the others or whatever. You can get devotional readings nowadays that only last a minute. It only takes you a minute to read it, and you're done. That's all you need for the day. God never said that. <laughs> Jesus never said that. The devotional says that. It's all you need. One minute. And that sounds good to some people, there's no doubt, because you're not wasting time. <laughs> wasting time. You can get scripture readings, for example, that only last a minute too. I've been in churches where the goal is to get through the message just as fast as possible. Preferably 10, 15 minutes max. 
I have always been amazed at how little some people want to hear about God. How little some people want to hear about Jesus. You know, let's keep it down to five minutes. I've had family members that say, well, we think Pastor so-and-so over here at this other church along the lake is really, really good, you know, because he only talks for like five minutes. I don't understand so-called Christianity that thinks we need to get by with as little Jesus as possible. Just a little bit of Jesus. It seems many want as little of Jesus as they can get. When I was a student preacher in a church one time, and my sermon, I preached this one particular Sunday, I still remember like it was yesterday, I I preached for more than 15 minutes. I don't know, 20, I don't know. And later in the week, it came to my attention that I was criticized for it. Sometimes don't you wish people would just be quiet about stuff? You know, it was Reverend uh, Thompson that shared with me later in a week. Yeah, a couple of people complained. And I <laughs> complained about what? A couple of ladies were upset that it made them late for getting their maids on track for the all-important Sunday dinner. <sighs> That's not Christianity, people. I mean, can you imagine it? I mean, I can't. I can't imagine it that people could be that unchristian and not know it and not see it and not feel it. A church that wants just as little of Jesus as they can possibly get, it sure isn't what Jesus had in mind when he spent those 40 days when he could have been up in heaven 40 days after the resurrection, endeavoring to get all of his followers on track. And I, and, I, and I use that word purposely. I don't know what else I would call it. To get them on track. You know, I mean, isn't that a word that's used for races and things like that? Track. Same track. They had to be on the same track. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 says, He showed himself alive after, the, after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, watch, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You know what that is, don't you? The kingdom of God is the rule of God. It is the reign of God. It's not trying to get as little of Jesus as you possibly can get. Our God is in control. And he had a purpose in in the early followers of Jesus, seeing him for who he is. They had to see him alive. Had to. Or otherwise, they don't get it. It's right out of the Bible. And he also has a purpose in having us seeing him spiritually, that is. See, we've got to understand that. It's not just the disciples that had to see Jesus. We need to see Jesus. Amen? And it's with what I might call the mind's eye, but better yet, with the heart. Okay? With the heart. You're not going to sit down here and, you know, sit on the couch with your whatever and monitor your TV watching and all that kind of... No. uh -uh. No. That's not the point. Okay, he's looking for a people that want him and aren't just going to put up with him. All right. I mean, the question is, do you see him as the God of you, which is what Thomas came to, as well as the Lord of you? Is that how you see him? Is that how you know him? I mean, really. It really is all about distance, not speed. It's about distance. The pastor from Times Square said, we are told over and over again in the scriptures that it is by faith that all these things were even possible. Always keeping in mind that faith is only as powerful as who you put your faith in. Biblical faith always 
depends upon its object. You can have little faith in thick ice and still survive. You can have great faith in thin ice and still drown. It's the object that is the issue. The Bible never says, believe only. Just believe. And that's what people are going around saying now. It doesn't matter what you believe, just believe something. That's the big byword of the day. You don't have to believe what the Bible says about this or that or something else. Just believe something. And down you go. The Bible never says believe only. It says believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It never says have faith, but rather have faith in God. Mark chapter 11, verse 22. And that's when you recognize who this Jesus is. And for Thomas, and I don't know, I think that's the way it is with everybody. He's your Lord. Your Lord. Your Lord. Personal. You know, my great teacher, my great master. It's personal. He's your Lord, and praise God, he's your God. Amen? My Lord and my God. You're not going to get Thomas to go in any other direction but that. Once you see that, once you know that, once your heart has grappled with it, you don't go anywhere else but to Jesus. Amen? I think it's so crucial. Father, we do need to have this in our hearts here today. I thank you, Lord, for Thomas. Oh, would it have been good if he just kind of stayed where he was and didn't bother showing up and so forth? No. And I want you to notice Jesus didn't go run into him and say, Thomas, you got to come, you got to come, you got to come. You need this, you need, no, he didn't do that. He needs to know he needs Jesus. And that's something that's going on in his heart. Okay? And of course the disciples, they said, we saw him. We saw him. And I think Thomas wanted to see him. I think Thomas wanted to know who this Jesus really is. And how else could he put it? My Lord and my God. Oh, Lord. Lord. Lord and God. Lord and God. Touch all of our hearts, dear God, that we also, Lord, as Thomas did, would come away from any other thinking any other plan, any other way of being, to come away from it and come into a place where you are truly Lord and God. Personal Lord and God. My Lord and God. I thank you for this, Lord. I don't think it can be put really any other way. That's what it is. And thank you that Thomas did see it rightly as the time wore down. And I want to thank you that we also, dear God, need to have that same, that same vision. That same vision. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we know, dear God, that it is your mercy that you would take the time to appear to all of these, your followers. And it's your mercy, dear God, that you take this time, this time, and other times when we gather to truly see Jesus as he really is, my Lord and my God. It isn't just for the first disciples. It's also for all of us. And we want to thank you for that, dear God. Oh, God, we need to thank you. 
You are Lord and God, and you are ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God.